Hello, everyone, and welcome to Wanna Celebrate, What You Need to Know About Wanna Cry. My name is Travis Smith. I am a security researcher here at Tripwire, and today I wanted to go over a few of the details of the Wanna Cry ransomware campaign, which hit uh, in the week of uh, May 12, 2017, and go over some details of what happened, uh, some of the information about how it spread, how it's infecting people, uh, how it was stopped, and how we can protect ourselves going forward in the future. So getting into the history of what happened here. So in late 2016, uh, August 2016 to be exact, um, the shadow brokers announced that they had stolen a set of uh, cyber weapons from a group called the Equation Group, uh, and that they were not going to, going to uh, sell them or anything, but they were actually just going to slowly release them over time. Uh, these are believed to have been exploits and toolkits used by the NSA uh, for their nation state attacks. Um, and they were stolen in some manner, and now they are going to, they're threatening to release them. Going forward, uh, they start, slowly started releasing some of these tools. In, um, in January, they released a screenshot of here's the list of the tools that we have. And here is what we are going to do. Um, you know, here's what we are going to release. Um, then shortly after, um, famously in, in January, Microsoft switched to a new release process. Uh, in February of 2017, they completely delayed their patch Tuesday and pushed it back uh, a whole month. Uh, we can see a screenshot here of their uh, announcement of what they're saying. And essentially, they said, we, we discovered a last minute issue that could impact some customers. Uh, which was not resolved in time for the Tuesday update. So we're just going to delay this uh, and then roll everything up into March. Uh, so come March 2017, they released a, a huge set of patches which fixed uh, quite a few of these vulnerabilities. If we look at what these vulnerabilities are, um, we can see that you know, there, is, uh, there was actually quite a few different CVE numbers that were associated to these. But the one that was uh, exploited by this WannaCry ransomware campaign uh, was, was a code name called Eternal Blue, which had a, a CVE number of 2017-0144. Uh, so these were filed on March 16th of 2017, at least that's when they were you know, made, made public, um, and were rated uh, highly critical from the, the CVSS scoring, uh, looking at the, the version 2 scoring of 9.3 or versus the version 3 scoring of 8.1. Uh, so definitely something that is critical and that we want to take a look at uh, when you are sorting on which patches to install or which vulnerabilities to address across your environment. The Microsoft Security Bulletin uh, that this was dealing with is MS17010. Uh, and again, this was released in their, their Patch Tuesday release in March on March 14th uh, with their, their highest severity rating of critical. Uh, so definitely, you know, from... Uh, when it came out, we know, okay, this is going to be something, you know, this, the, these patches, we didn't know what they were, what they addressed, but we know that these are something that we want to take a look at and deal with uh, pretty quickly. So in April of 2017, a month after the uh, you know, Microsoft released, released their patches and we have a CVE number for these, the Shadow Brokers uh, did a full release of all of their tools. Um, so there's a complete dump of these tools, and we had people analyzing these and saying, okay, well, this is, uh, you know, some pretty cool stuff. Here's a, you know, an exploit toolkit very similar to uh, the Metasploit framework that they were using, uh, you know, loaded it up with some of their, their exploits. Um, so they were very uh, platform-specific, so some of them were very specific to older platforms like uh, Windows XP or 2003 or things like that. Uh, and there wasn't a lot of uh, cross-functionality across platforms, uh, and it was you know, some, not entirely difficult to use, but somewhat difficult to uh, you know, port this over. And there wasn't an immediate risk of these tools going to be uh, used you know, that day or that, you know, that weekend that they were released uh, for uh, you know, get running rampant in the wild. So uh, it was a, you know, kind of a, a wake-up call for a lot of people in the security industry that they want to, uh, you know, potentially know that there, these things are out there uh, and, you know, something, you know, the storm is brewing, so to speak, and, and something is going to come. So the, the day after that, you know, they released the tools, Microsoft released a, uh, you know, announcement. They wrote up a blog saying, you know, yeah, these are, these are dangerous and these are, you know, something that we want to take a look at and are, 
you know, but know that you know, you're already protected, uh, whether that is from the patches that came out in March last month, you know, from the time that this was released. We can see, you know, things like Eternal Blue or Eternal Romance or Eternal Synergy, right? So these were, you know, vulnerabilities and, and bugs in their code that were fixed, you know, a month ago. Uh, versus things that were fixed, you know, almost nine years ago. We see, you know, the Eclipsed Wing that was fixed in an MS-08 uh, patch release. Uh, so, you know, customers already had a chance to say, okay, well, these tools are out there. They're going to they're going to be weaponized eventually uh, in some point. Um, so, you know, just know that you're addressed and you have options to to fix you know your environment and get yourself up and running. And sure enough, um, come May 12, 2017, uh, somebody had weaponized the Eternal Blue exploit, uh, and they they deployed this into a uh, you know, ransomware that, that that has been dubbed Wanna uh, Cry, and uh, which was a self-propagating uh, set of ransomware. So what made this unique versus other ransomware uh, campaigns was it wasn't uh, relying on people clicking on a you know an, a malicious link in a phishing email or opening up a, a malicious attachment uh, that would execute locally. Uh, there was no user intervention, and it would self-propagate itself not only over the you know the local internet of wherever uh, it was connected to, or the you know the local intranet I should say, uh, but it was also propagating across the entire internet. So it was self uh, you know exploiting everything directly connected to the internet, which was vulnerable to this specific vulnerability that we saw for uh, WannaCry and the internal blue uh, vulnerability. So, um, so let's take a look at, you know, the details of how this actually, this works. So from the very beginning, to, you know, the whole, you know, the tactics, techniques, and procedures, the TTPs of this campaign, you know, what exactly does this thing do? So it uses the eternal blue exploit to be able to deliver a malicious payload to an endpoint. Um, that malware well then, you know, it's going to exploit this, you know, vulnerability which is over uh, SMB. And if it, you know, if the system is vulnerable, it's going to exploit, deliver payload, and that's going to execute. As soon as that happens, it's going to reach out to this uh, very, you know, random-looking domain uh, to see if it is live or not. And here's where kind of things get interesting and kind of confusing, honestly, of of why they do this. Uh, but it's going to make a call out to this, uh, make an HTTP request to see if, it, if this server is live or not. Uh, if the server does connect, the malware will just stop executing and it won't do anything. Essentially, it's just a kill switch for this malware. Uh, if it can't connect to this server, um, you know, if the server is dead and or not connecting to an H or responding to an HTTP request, then it's just going to continue its uh, course and then uh, write its payload to a uh, malicious executable on the system. So it's the MSS EC, uh, SVC uh, executable that's placed in the Windows directory. And that's where all the payload stuff lives for this piece of malware. What that's then going to do um, is what all ransomware does, it's going to start encrypting all of your local files. Um, so. Um, you know, just exactly what it's, every ransomware is going to do. It's going to look for important-ish files on the operating system, things like Word documents and pictures and uh, spreadsheets, you know, everything that, you know, you find valuable, val sorry, valuable, uh, whether you are a business that has this important data or you are uh, a grandmother that has a picture of all your grandkids on your desktop. So it's going to find all that what's important. Um, the other unique aspect of this is that it gave you two different sets of times. Um, so we can see here this is a, you know, a subset of the, the screenshot that we saw on the previous slide uh, of two different counters. So it's saying uh, make a payment on this specific one saying by uh, May 16th. Um, if you don't, uh, the payment is then going to be raised. Um, then the first set of payments was uh, $300. So if you pay $300 within three days, uh, you're going to get your files back. Um, at that point, if you do not pay, that counter is going to keep going up and it's going to give you six days um, from the original infection date. So it's going to give you an, an, another three days to say, uh, you know, make the payment and you will be able to get the decryption for, for that. And they, you know, to give you that extra set of days to figure out, you know, for people that, you know, don't know how Bitcoin works, they're completely confused or maybe they're just scrambling to see if they can, you know, figure out a way to decrypt the files themselves, which, you know, we haven't been able to do or if they have backups. Uh, so you have up to six days to be able to prevent uh, your, to get your decryption key from the attacker. If that time runs out, then uh, you're out of luck and you can't get your data back. 
Um, this is typically where most ransomware that we've seen stops. Um, it just infects you and then you're done. It doesn't do anything else. What this one does, this campaign with WannaCry, what it does, it's uh, it's you know a self-propagating worm, uh, which is you know interesting that we used to have these all the time, you know, back in the good old days of information security. So there's quite a few pe quite a few people in information security now that this is the first worm that they're experiencing, and it's kind of fun from a you know a, a history perspective. So what this is doing is uh, on the local network, uh, it's then going to start scanning out uh, on TCP 445, which is the the SMB protocol. Uh, looking for things on the local network uh, that are vulnerable to this thing. Uh, it's going to just start reaching out and then infecting them and then starting back over here. And it's uh, doing this uh, a thread 10 times. Uh, so it's going to start doing this you know, in sets of 10 to try to find all of these different devices. Uh, if, it's a, if it finds it's vulnerable, we're going to get you know, right back up here in the, into the upper left of you know, exploiting Eternal Blue, uh, writing the payload, reaching out to the domain, so on and so forth, until you know, this thing just can't, can't find anything more that vulnerable. Uh, the next what it's going to do is then it's going to reach out to the internet and start scanning things on uh, TCP 445. So it's going to create a, a random list of IP addresses to reach out uh, and then just start scanning to see if 445 uh, responds or not. So it's not seeing if the uh, if the endpoint that it's scanned is vulnerable or not. It's just seeing if port 445 is open, uh, and it's going to do this for 128 random IP addresses on the internet. Uh, if it does find that port 445 is open and available, it's then going to scan that uh, IP address's full slash 24 range to, uh, to see if all of those IP addresses are vulnerable or not, and then go through the same workflow. See, is that, uh, is, are these individual ones vulnerable or not, and then infect, uh, infect those, uh, get, you know, get their ransomware put on there, and then start this process all over again. Um, so, you know, this is a very high-level view of what this uh, particular piece of ransomware is doing and how it is unique versus other ransomware campaigns. So I mentioned earlier that the, the fact that it was reaching out to this domain and seeing if it was uh, valid or not and just only looking for an HTTP response uh, to either uh, continue executing or just stop executing uh, once and forever, uh, once and all. And if it you know, reached out, it would just be what we call a kill switch. And that's important to know. So the reason it's important to know is as uh, there is a researcher that runs a, a website called MalwareTech. Uh, he just blogs all of his security research, uh, who is a, a pseudo-anonymous uh, security researcher until all this hit and he got kind of a lot of fame in journalists. Uh, doxed him and, and released all of his private information, which is unfortunate. Uh, but he was he was looking at this and saw that it was this the malware was reaching out to this domain, um, which was unregistered at the time. Uh, so Friday afternoon, uh, UTC time, he noticed this, saw that it was reaching out to the domain, um, and saw that it was it was unregistered. So he just went ahead and registered the domain, and uh, just had a sinkhole, uh, you know, a DNS sinkhole into a that you know he wasn't doing anything with it. Uh, and, you know, after further review of the code, he realized that you know by registering this domain and having it resolved to something, uh, essentially enabled the kill switch on this uh, ransomware campaign. So this is why we ha we saw a slowdown of infections uh, late Friday afternoon through the weekend uh, for the initial version of this uh, piece of malware. Uh, so we don't know why there is this kill switch in there. It's actually uh, kind of confusing on why they have that. Um, you know, there's some people that are saying, well, maybe it's a way to, uh, you know, obfuscate the, this code a little bit for malware researchers so they can't see what's going on, uh, which isn't really a good way to, to try to hide what the code is doing from, from malware researchers. It actually uh, draws attention to yourself in ways exactly outlined what happened here. Uh, it just looks like it's bad design. Uh, if they wanted to kill switch, um, you know, why didn't they just register that domain themselves, and that way they had the ability to, to own that. That way the security researcher couldn't do it. Uh, and they didn't learn from their mistake. They released another version of the WannaCry malware, uh, which had a different unique URL, but again, they didn't register it. Uh, and another security researcher saw this, registered it, set it up as a DNS sinkhole, and then stopped the next round of, of um, campaigns for this WannaCry malware. Uh, so yeah, so we're not sure why this happened, but uh, you know, there's some, some some good work going on by security researchers around the world that are that were able to stop this infection. So the aftermath of what happened uh, with with this. So um, there was a, a TrustWave report um, that was originally back in 2015, but still you know, really valid. Uh, you know, two years later, 
of uh, looking at the return on investment for ransomware campaigns. Um, and they found that the, the typical return on investment for uh, people that are perpetrating ransomware is around you know, just over 1,400%. Um, so if we look at that, of, a, of you know, the, the rate of their, you know, their typical infection path was uh, phishing, where they would get, you know, if they send out 100 phishing emails, 10%, you know, 10 of those people would click on it. Um, and of those 10 people that clicked on it, uh, you know, if you extrapolate that over, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of, of emails, uh, half a percent will actually pay that percentage. Uh, and if you look at that, um, their initial report was for 20,000 infections, uh, they'd make about $90,000 based off of around roughly $10,000 of um, investment. So, um, you know, numbers are kind of estimated there, but that's about what they what they said. Uh, if we look at the uh, WannaCry, um, you know, we don't really know what the infection rate was because it wasn't targeted like that since it was self-propagating. Um, but we do know that there were uh, about 200,000 uh, infections as of uh, early this week. And uh, of those 200,000 infections, there were uh, roughly uh, about two, a little over 200 people that had paid. Uh, and that was split between people either paying the $300 within the first three days or the $600 um, over the next uh, couple days. Um, and we know that this number of people paid because they used static uh, Bitcoin addresses. And all of uh, you know, all Bitcoin transactions uh, are public record, even though if we don't know who uh, is the owner of a Bitcoin wallet, we can see who is making uh, payments to these and then be able to track the amount of payment, the number of payments and the amount of payments that are going to this, these specific wallets. Uh, so we do know that they've made uh, a little over you know, $70,000 as of a couple days ago for this particular you know, set of ransomware. Um, so if we just look at the numbers here, uh, this ransomware campaign was not profitable whatsoever for the, the people that, that kicked this off. Uh, and you know, the, the reasons why um, it hasn't been profitable, there's a couple of them, uh, but we don't know, really know. So it's in the details, 200,000 infections, over 150 countries. Uh, with about 200 uh, ransom payments. And that, you know, that's continuing to go up slowly over time, but uh, it seems to be tailing off a little bit. Um, so part of the reason is the decryption process uh, for getting your files back is entirely manual. Uh, most ransomware campaigns, they just want to fire it and forget it and, uh, to, and move on with their lives and just watch the money roll in. Uh, so when you make a payment uh, to a Bitcoin wallet, it will deliver the the decryption key automatically to the, the victim, and they can then decrypt their files. Uh, there appears to be very, uh, there's interaction back and forth between the, um, the command and control servers and the victims that are having to deliver these uh, decryption keys. Uh, and there are actually quite a few reports of people paying the ransom and still waiting for uh, their decryption keys back. Uh, so there's people that are actually paying a ransom and not getting the the data back. So from a, uh, a criminal business perspective, uh, this is just bad business, right? You don't, you want to give people the uh, confidence that if they, you know, they pay you money, they're going to get something in return. So if they're, now that we're seeing that you know, people are paying and they're not getting their files back, they're going to be less likely to pay, you know, going forward. So this, you know, the payout rate may stay the same or it's going to start even going down because people aren't confident that they're giving up you know, hundreds of their hard-earned dollars to get uh, the data back that they want to get back, and that's really unfortunate. So, um, so now that we know how this happened and what it looked like, um, you know, I want to start getting into how to protect yourselves going forward. Um, and, you know, it's said over and over again, and it's not really helpful that after you've already been infected, and it's not really a helpful way to, to say this you know, to the security market at, at large, but you, know, you should patch your systems. Um, it's, for businesses, it's definitely a lot easier said than done, um, just because there's a huge history of patches causing issues and backwards compatibility and, and all this other stuff. So um, the patches were uh, made available back in March, um, and I have a list here of all of the KB numbers for these patches, which are specifically 
related to each individual platform. Um, so if you're curious about your different platforms that you have and you have a set of 2008 or 2008 or 2 or uh, you know, Windows 7 machines here, you can see which KB numbers that uh, you should focus on if you, if you are in the business of delaying patches for, for compatibility issues and you have a, a very detailed uh, you know, patch management process where you have to put them through uh, dev and testing and then you know, finally push them out to, to production. Uh, these are the ones that you can focus on first to be able to uh, protect yourself from the, the, you know, the WannaCry ransomware uh, and this, you know, this eternal blue vulnerability. Um, so for all of the supported platforms um, that are actively supported by, by Microsoft, those are made available in March. Um, this campaign was so successful and made such a big splash that Microsoft actually released patches um, over the weekend uh, for Windows XP, 2003R2, and Windows 8. So these are uh, platforms which are not supported by Microsoft um, actively, but you, you know, they don't give you security updates, but they're giving you these um, because this is such a critical issue. Uh, and th these KV articles are listed on the spreadsheet on the right. I have a blog post up on Tripwire's blog, uh, which gives you a little bit more information about each one of these patches, and you can um, you know, pull the, the spreadsheet off of that, uh, that blog post if you're curious. And there's a link here, uh, tripwire.com slash state of security, where you can go get that uh, information if you're curious. So if you don't want to patch, uh, the next best thing is to, uh, to block the, the network traffic from getting in, uh, especially if you have uh, Windows devices which are directly connected to the Internet. Um, it's always been be best practice not to uh, allow 445 um, directly connected over the Internet, but it does happen. Um, or you, know, you do need it for specific business reasons, uh, reasons but if you don't, uh, block 445 at the perimeter uh, if at all possible. Um, for individual machines, uh, it's easy enough to use um, the local Windows firewall if you'd like uh, and block port 445. So this, this is all spreading over SMB, TCP, 445. Uh, so just placing firewalls um, is going to be able to stop this thing from being able to reach out and self-infect itself across your environment. Um, we do know that it's only over 445 right now, but there's no reason why it can't uh, jump over to different ports, specifically uh, 139. Um, so, you know, block 139 as well if you are, you know, just trying to proactively prevent something like this from uh, mutating into a, a bigger virus to, to get across your environment. Uh, the next step would be to uh, disable SMB. Um, so if you can't install patches uh, and you can't make firewall changes to your environment, uh, you can disable SMB uh, version 1. Uh, so for the Windows 2008 R2 uh, and earlier for server class operating systems or Windows 7 and earlier uh, desktop uh, operating systems, you can make a, key, a registry key change and just push that out to the, uh, all of the uh, systems. Uh, so the registry key here um, is listed. Uh, the key name is SMB1. Uh, if the key doesn't exist, you're good. Um, if the key exists and it's set to zero, uh, you're good, but if the key exists and you're set to 1, that means SMB1 is enabled. Uh, so make sure the key either doesn't exist or you have that value set to 0. For newer operating systems, so 2012 and higher, um, so you know, think uh, Windows uh, 8, 8.1, uh, 10 for desktop class, or 2012, 2012 R2 and 2016, for server class operating systems, you have to issue uh, an sc.exe command to uh, disable SMB version 1. So there's two commands that you can do. They're listed here. Um, if you want more information as far as the registry keys um, for that we saw on the previous slide, uh, or if you wanted to get information on these SC commands, there's this link here um, from Microsoft for a support article on how to enable uh, SMB version 1, 2, or 3. Uh, you only need to do uh, version 1, um, but it also gives you instructions on how to, you know, enable it as well if you need to go back and forth between, uh, you know, testing things if you disabled version 1 and it broke an application. So a really good resource if um, you're interested in the disabling the service uh, for um, your SMB1 across your Windows deployments. So Tripwire's released content uh, that can detect the, that if WannaCry is vulnerable on your machines. Uh, so for Tripwire Enterprise and Tripwire CCM, we do have content available on our uh, Tripwire Customer Center. Uh, so if you go there, we have a completely revamped content engine now that you can find uh, and download content 
Uh, so we can see a screenshot here. We have the, the TE and CCM uh, content, which will uh, detect a couple of things. So one, it's going to see if the registry key uh, that we mentioned earlier uh, is present on the systems or not. Uh, and if it is, if it's set to zero or one, and alert you if uh, you're vulnerable or not. Um, as well as get a list of all of the patches that are installed related to this, um, this MS17010 vulnerability. So a few slides back, that huge table of all of those KB numbers is going to check to see if those are installed or not. Uh, and if they're not, uh, it will tell you, you know, per platform, this is the patch that is not uh, installed on this machine, uh, then it's potentially vulnerable to the, uh, the WannaCry ransomware campaign. Uh, from the IP360 standpoint, uh, since this was uh, fixed in the Microsoft release of patches back in March, um, this was in the update from the, the, the VERT team of their IP360 content. So from a vulnerability scanning perspective, um, just download the latest uh, IP360 content, uh, scan your environment, and you'll know, uh, and you would have known since March, if the, any of your machines from uh, across your environment are vulnerable to this uh, as well. So finally, a couple of resources where uh, you can find some more information. Um, so we've had a couple different researchers um, and uh, folks here within Tripwire uh, provide some really good information uh, on our blog about you know, the, de the details of WannaCry, the details of the, the Shadow Brokers exploits, uh, and what that means for uh, specific markets, or what it means you know, for things like this, of, of how does this work, or, or how do I know if I'm vulnerable, or, or, and just all the, the good details that you need without all of the marketing FUD around uh, what WannaCry is, or what ransomware is in general. Um, uh, there's also a really good video uh, that was put out by uh, a colleague of mine, PJ, um, that explains how WannaCry works and how Tripwire can help. Uh, so highly recommend checking out this video here um, on Vimeo. Um, really good information there. Um, and then finally, uh, the link to the, the blogger who uh, slowed down the initial infection, the malware tech. Uh, he has some really good information um, if you're you know, very inclined at looking at the details of of how this malware worked and looking at the, the you know, the, the Win DBG, uh, you know, screenshots and all that kind of uh, geeky stuff that, that security researchers love to check out. He has a lot of that good information on his website. So thank you for, for joining me today um, and, you know, learning a little bit about WannaCry ransomware uh, and how it works and how you can protect yourself going forward. Um, feel free to reach out to me anytime if you have any questions, um, either on Twitter at Mr. Trav or emailing me directly uh, at tsmith at tripwire.com. And thank you.